Welcome to the Thursday, June 3rd edition of Carbon Removal Newsroom. This afternoon, I have with me, as always, Holly Jean Buck, Assistant Professor of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Buffalo in New York. Hey, Holly, how are you doing? Doing great. How are you? I'm hanging in there. The weather's been amazing in Seattle, so can't complain. I also have a fellow University of Washington alumni, though not current Washington State resident, Quill Robinson, Vice President of Government Affairs for the American Conservation Coalition. Hey, Quill, thanks for joining us today. Hi there. Good to be here. And of course, go dogs. <laughs> That's right. Let's hope we have a good football season this year. We will see what this year brings. And then finally, I'm Radhika Mulgafkar, Head of Supply and Methodology here at Nori. So today we have two main topics. First off, we're gonna start off with the gas and oil industry because as one environmentalist said, was this the day of reckoning for big oil and gas? There was lots of news out there about different litigation strategies and shareholder activism, but it seems like other things are going in the direction of oil and gas. So maybe there's some tension with those. Also, we're gonna follow up with a question about whether nature-based solutions help bridge the gap, not only in the carbon removal space, but between political parties. So can it soil do more than just heal the earth, but also heal the political divide? Not sure, but we'll see what we come up with. With that, Holly, big, big news coming out of the oil and gas industry this past week. We have three new activist board members for Exxon. We have Chevron losing a shareholder vote and having to take into account not only their own emissions, but scope three or customer emissions and legal action in Australia and the Netherlands that are having impacts. So what was your, what was your thinking? Yeah, I mean, this is all cool. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good signals, but you know, what's the next step beyond making these signals, right? It's, it's no substitute for actually actively managing the decline of fossil fuels, because for that, you need two things. You need to actually decrease demand, which requires all kinds of policies across multiple sectors. And as one of the articles you shared pointed out, Radhika, you know, demand is rebounding. Much as much peace, I mean, people anticipated that it would rebound after COVID, so it's not like a shock, but, you know, you have to decrease demand. Otherwise, you wind up in this situation um, where you might have cut production, but, uh, you know, <laughs> what's going to make up the difference, right? So Jason Bordov has a good piece um, this week in Foreign Policy about that, where higher gas prices would then embolden new attacks on Biden's policy choices. And, you know, there could be actually a political setback. So that's one thing. The other thing is that you need to have an exit strategy for all countries. Otherwise, production that closes down in one area just shifts to some other jurisdiction. So I think this is all good, but I don't think we should be too caught up in, you know, this idea of a social tipping point quite yet. You know, I was not as excited about the legal action that came out of the Netherlands, because for one, it's a different jurisdiction, but for two, I think history has taught us that legislating from the bench, at least in this country, can lead to some unforeseen or unwanted consequences. What I did find interesting, and I would love to get both your opinions on this, is the switch in the board at Exxon. That to me seems like maybe a longer lasting strategy to forcing significant change in these companies. So maybe I'll start with you, Quill, what you thought of that strategy. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely interesting to, to see the, you know, the two different significant events that happened in Europe and, you know, in the US. I, you know, I'm a little skeptical, like you said, legislating for the bench, I don't think is a good idea. And it's not really a, a sustainable direction in terms of governance. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the case in the US was I mean, I've read some things that have said it's a bit overstated and the impact of these new board members um, will be somewhat limited, but I'm for it. I mean, this is the private sector. This is, you know, shareholder accountability. The folks who own this company are saying, we want you to incorporate these considerations in terms of climate. I'm enthusiastic about that. I mean, it's better than the government coming in and, and trying to dictate what private companies should be doing. And I think that it's really evidence of the fact that uh, you know, the activism um, and the grassroots work of millions of young people around the world um, is having an impact on the private sector. I mean, something that I always say to, to young people is, look, we vote, you know, uh, for president every four years, but every single day when you spend your money on, you know, one company or another, that's a much more rapid form of accountability. And so I love to see that sort of, you know, movement forward 
accountability action and you know the increasing incorporation of climate considerations uh, in the private sector, not just happening from top down government um, dictates. Polly, any thoughts? Well, I think a lot of people online were just entranced by Andy Karsner's title as Space Cowboy at X. And, you know, this kind of narrative appeal of there being something new and different than your standard image of like a oil and gas major board member. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, as a sociologist, I'm entranced by, you know, this idea of how these signals translate into material effects. So I guess I'll keep an open mind about what'll happen. I'm most interested in the third board member who just won, I think, yesterday from Google, because I am interested in seeing how there's going to be this more tightly, hopefully, niche between the technologies that Google is interested in and how it can bring brought forth to the exons of the world, even though I know they have huge R&D develop, you know, parts of their companies it seems like the missions are a little bit different and it might be interesting to see how they can translate it. I also was a bit intrigued by the actions of the Chevron shareholder voters that wanted them to take into account scope three emissions, which for listeners who may not be as familiar are sort of emissions not directly related to the company, but their users emissions, so customer emissions. And unclear to me, how they would go about doing it, but I thought it was an interesting statement by the shareholders. Holly, did you think anything of that or just happy to see it? Yeah, I was just happy to see that. <laughs> what about you, Quill? Is that like exactly where you want them to be, the shareholder shareholder accountability instead of government accountability? Yeah, I mean, broadly, but I think as we probably all, you know, agree here, time will tell in terms of the the actual effectiveness thing, you know, here. I, I mean, the exciting thing for me is that I, I think this is probably counter to a lot of the narrative that we hear in the environmental movement, but I actually think that oil and gas majors um, are our biggest potential allies in the fight against climate change. Um, I know, hot take, uh, but they have, you know, they have the capital, they have the knowledge about the energy energy industry, and increasingly they have the incentive, you know, because in a hundred years they still want to be energy companies, and being exclusively an oil and gas company is not going to result in being a company in a hundred years. They have the incentive um, to make this transformation, and so I think that. Um, you know, we should, of course, be skeptical with, you know, the, the, the history of some of these companies uh, on this issue of climate change. But if we're looking at this from a, a pragmatic, realistic perspective, and we want to see greenhouse gas emissions go down, it, we should encourage this and, you know, do this sort of positive accountability and figure out more ways that these companies can actually lead in the response to climate change. Holly, anything to say in response? I mean, I think that people who are against fossil fuel production sometimes take this approach that, you know, there's some kind of evil magic inherent in the commodity. Um, and I don't agree with that. I think the problem with the fossil fuel companies is the social relations that, you know, they've produced and, you know, the, the oppression they've enjoyed, you know, up to this point. And I don't really see the signals of that changing drastically because what um, a company like Shell will do is just spin off their worst polluting assets to some other company, right? So it would be far more progressive to have some mechanism to force them to clean up old wells and that kind of thing. Yeah, which brings up that fairly interesting, maybe shocking sort of report that the New York Times did this week talking about the methane emissions from the smallest emitters. Really, what they found, the EPA has found, is that often the emissions just get moved to a smaller company that buys the asset from another company, from a big oil and gas company. So not sure, Holly, what you thought of that. I assume you and I are on the same page where that doesn't seem right, but how do you solve that problem? Do you have any ideas? Are you too, Quill? How do you solve that? They're allowed to sell their assets. The free market is, somebody wants to purchase them. What do you do about something like that? Well, I mean, I, I think that there's a, an interesting opportunity here. And from my little perch in DC, I've actually heard a lot of discussion, both from Republicans and Democrats about, you know, plugging uh, abandoned oil and gas wells um, and that sort of thing. And it actually, I, I mean, that ties really well into President Biden's, um, you know, sort of just transition uh, framework here. I mean, 
a lot of these communities um, in former traditional energy communities, you know, that's a good way we can put people to work. So, I mean, even as a conservative here, I, I think that that's a good way that the, the government could spend money um, and hopefully get the, the private sector actors involved as well in, you know, plugging these old wells and addressing that. I mean, in terms of the question of whether they should be sell, be able to sell those assets, of course they should, just as they should be able to buy up, you know, renewable assets and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, there's a great opportunity for us to come in, um, put people to work who are being hurt by, uh, you know, the energy transition, um, doing something that will help reduce uh, net greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, I mean, I can, I get concerned about the accounting though. What I'm, what I'm struggling with, and I don't think we have an answer for is you see a big companies taking credit for it, but really it hasn't of reducing their emissions, I should say, but in reality, we haven't lowered any emissions. So how, maybe it's more about a tracking issue through the EPA. I'm not sure, but it was a little disheartening to read that the 20% that one of these companies claimed was really just moved over to another company. Holly, anything else you want to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a role for federal policy and just regulating these leaks. I think there's a role for the tech sector in terms of some of the cool stuff that's coming online with satellite detection of methane leaks in real time and that kind of thing. My concern is what happens on the global scale when you know, companies under pressure in, in the US or Europe pull out of investments in countries in the global south and those assets get bought up by somebody who has even less incentive to run them well. So even though, I mean, there's a federal thing here, but there's also a global dimension we need to be thinking about. Yeah, really good point. Speaking of global, I've got to ask, well, I'm going to put you a little on the hot seat, but I was hearing this report um, this week about the the Nora Stream pipeline that runs, you know, from Russia under the Baltic Sea to Germany, and it made me wonder why are so many Republicans so against, it, or it feels like they're against decarbonizing our our systems. When from a geopolitical strategic perspective, it seems to align perfectly. Like we don't want Russia to have more power, to have the ability to pipe gas straight to Germany, to bypass Poland, whatever the long-term ramifications. But you would think supporting a new free market enterprise would be in their interest. So what's your hot take on that? Well, yeah, you actually hit a topic I'm really interested in. Um, I, I lived in Germany for a year on a, a fellowship. And so and I worked in German politics too and got to talk a lot about Nord Stream too. Um, I mean, the fact, I mean, the fact is, is that, you know, geopolitically Nord Stream 2 is bad for the United States and our allies, for Ukraine and, and you know, many other of our NATO allies. Um, and it's just, uh, it's a, you know, a pipeline of money going the other direction into the pocket of a, a pretty awful person in, in Vladimir Putin in a, in a corrupt government. Um, I, I mean, I think, and then you look at the reason that Germany is so for this is because they've really pursued an unscientific climate agenda. Um, they axed nuclear energy in, in Germany, which just, it goes completely against the science. Um, luckily, we haven't done that here in the United States. Um, and hopefully we don't go in that direction. But you look at their neighbors, they have much cheaper energy in France um, because of nuclear energy. And so Germany has pursued this unscientific climate energy agenda. Now they're having to, um, you know, they're, they're forced put in this weird position where they, ha they have to buy dirty Russian natural gas. And I think that's really uh, <laughs> a model of how not to go about climate action. Um, and I mean, the fact is, is that Russian natural gas has a, I believe it's around 40% higher life cycle carbon impact as opposed to American natural gas. Um, so I think all the stars align here for us to oppose Nord Stream 2, you know, geopolitically, uh, climate-wise, um, just in terms of our place in the world. And actually, you know, there was just a hearing last week where um, a Republican member of Congress made the, the made, was talking to Secretary uh, Granholm and was saying, you know, this is bad for the climate and it's bad for our geopolitical interests. So I actually hear a lot of Republicans making the case that this is both bad for the climate and bad for our geopolitical interests. So, um, I mean, and, and the other fact is that we should be exporting American natural gas because it is much cleaner in, in many cases around the world. Um, it will lower, um, it, you know, create a much lower carbon impact um, than the sources of energy that they currently use. So, I mean, I, I'm hearing Republicans oppose this. I think it's for a good reason. Um, and I think it's good policy or for a lot of reasons for us to oppose Nord Stream 2. Yeah, I was more curious about just the broader Republican resistance to decarbonizing. Like, it seems like overall, it should be something they want to do. It's new jobs. It make, lowers our dependency on actors we don't want to be dependent on, even 
even within our within our own energy system, even if we have things like shale and all that, we still are dependent. So why in a sentence, can you tell me why they are so anti decarbonization or it feels like they are? They're not. That's my answer, but I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, please. Um, you know, in 2017, when my organization was founded, um, it was hard for us to get a meeting with a Republican to talk about climate change. That's a fact. President Trump, not very interested in climate change, not going to argue over that. Um, the fact is, is that just in the last couple of months, um, Kevin McCarthy, the highest ranking Republican in the House of Representatives, unveiled a comprehensive climate package. Um, you know, this weekend, ACC is holding a conservative climate rally in Miami, Florida, with multiple Republican members of Congress and the Republican mayor of Miami. Um, you know, there are certainly some folks, I mean, there's the, the guy who held up the snowball on the, on the, the you know, Congress floor, he's, he's still there. But I'm telling you, in the last year in particular, we've seen a shift um, from climate denial to climate action. And maybe I'm a little biased, but I actually think that the conservative solutions that Republicans in Congress are, are pushing uh, are really effective solutions that are actually going to help us decarbonize. But the difference is, is that we're not anti-fossil fuel or anti-greenhouse gas emissions. And so I think there's a little bit of a perspective difference there. Fair enough. Holly, any, anything you want to say in response? I'm looking forward to seeing it. Awesome. All right, I'll give you, let me, let me get in there with one nugget then, okay? <laughs> Energy Act it. of 2020, biggest climate bill that we've passed in over 10 years. Republicans were at the table battery storage, carbon capture, advanced nuclear. That was Republicans who were hand in hand with Democrats getting one of the most significant pieces of climate legislation across the finish line in December. So that, that's that's my nugget. A lot, lot more to do, but I, I think the trajectory is good right now. It's a nice way to leave this topic and actually segue into our next topic, which is whether these nature-based solutions in carbon capture are a way to kind of bridge the political divide we are kind of talking it, about it in, in relationship to Kiss the Ground, which was a documentary released in 2020. It's available on Netflix. And it, the premise of it is essentially that soil can solve a lot of the issues we have around climate change. Quill, tell me what you were thinking when you mentioned it healing the divide between Republicans and Democrats. Yeah, definitely. So I, I guess I, I think back to when I was um, 11 years old and I went and saw An Inconvenient Truth uh, with my my mom's side of my family in, in Seattle and saw that movie and it scared the crap out of me. Um, I think that was my first exposure to the idea of climate change and global warming. You know, fast forward to 2020 when I saw this movie, Kiss the Ground, I was like, wow, this is different. You know, it's like acknowledges that there's a problem, but actually talks about like lots of real solutions. And I, I, I'm just like, I'm obsessed with this movie because it's so positive and it's so empowering. Um, and I think that you know, one of the challenges around climate change, and I think this is whether you're, you know, a, a progressive who feels like this is a number one issue, or even a, a conservative is a little bit more skeptical, is that climate change is so um, intangible. Uh, I mean, obviously, I know that there's, you know, rising sea levels and effects that many people are seeing, but I think for most people, climate change is, is a bit intangible. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting in the environmental movement, how like, polar bears and ice caps have been the, the symbols, whereas, you know, that doesn't, most people don't have those in their communities. So anyways, I mean, I think what, what's exciting about this um, movie and the idea of uh, natural carbon sequestration is that this brings climate policy back home into our own backyards, and it makes it a lot more tangible. Um, and so, you know, I, I know that nature-based solutions are not going to solve the issue, um, but it's a lot less politically charged um, and actually has the opportunity to empower many of the Americans who felt like they're on the wrong end of climate policy, um, who will be the victims of climate policy, to actually be the champions of climate solutions. And I, I just think, you know, that's such a cool idea. And, you know, I've been in D.C. for almost two years now, kind of working on the Hill, trying to convince more Republicans to, to think about climate change. And I just see so much potential in this approach um, and this positive message of empowering America's farmers and foresters and folks in the ag industry uh, to, to sequester carbon. So I, I'm just so excited about it. It gets me it gets me really pumped up. Not to mention you're a lover of the North Cascades and a lover of the outdoors. So, of course. I mean, how can you grow up in a place like Seattle and not be? Yeah, exactly. I'm curious, though, how you think we can reach um, bipartisan sort of consensus around this when it's also battling sort of current entrenched interests on both sides of the aisle, particularly kind of certain areas of the agricultural supply chain that might be a little bit less open to these solutions. 
Yeah, I mean, th there's certainly some, you know, nuts and bolts things that need to be worked out in, in terms of how you structure carbon markets and, you know, which which industries will benefit or which areas of the agricultural sector would benefit more and which would benefit less. You know, sure, there's all those elements to it. But I mean, just kind of to what we were talking about earlier, like fossil fuels is a really contentious issue, right? And that's something that we're going to argue over the, the role of that. And that's, a you know, the energy sector is difficult when it comes to climate change. There's not that same political charge uh, around natural solutions, in, in, in my view. Um, in, in fact, there's a lot of legislation that, you know, ACC is working on right now um, and supporting that has massive bipartisan support that would move the ball forward on natural climate solutions. Just an example of that, Growing Climate Solutions Act uh, makes it a little easier for folks in the ag sector to participate in carbon markets, um, puts, you know, money in the pockets of, of, of those folks um, to sequester more carbon and adopt more of those practices. I mean, last I checked, it's probably higher than now, but 47 co-sponsors in the Senate, Republican and Democrat. I mean, that's <laughs> that's happening in, Wa in Washington, D.C. right now, which is kind of surprising and amazing, and I think is indicative of the potential of, of, of natural solutions in this space. Sally, anything you want to add? Yeah, I'm wearing my Kiss the Ground t-shirt for this occasion. It says, soil is our common ground and it's purple. So... I think that I think that there is a lot of potential. You know, it's supported very well on both sides of the aisle. If you do public polling, like I've done a bit of, everybody loves soil carbon. I think my only reservation is that there could be a sort of moral hazard effect in in which people think that like soil will save us or soil can do it all. There's a little bit of that sometimes in the community. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of people reality checking that too. So I'm not super concerned about it. Um, and I, what I would hope is that some of the relationships and networks that can be built can be transferred to more ambitious things um, because soil, soil can help a bit, but we've got a lot more to do. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And a really something I think about is how do you translate soil to other, which it's hard not to support farmers. It's hard not to, I mean, it's a great story and it's, and it's a good story because there are wins on all sides, right? The, the farmers, the environment and their financial needs. But how do you translate that to other parts of the carbon marketplaces and other types of carbon drawdown? I mean, I think that it's I, so our our approach at, at ACC, we talk a lot about, you know, the unsexy term of incrementalism, but we actually think incrementalism is really important. I, you know, I came from Washington state where we have the loudest, boldest activists in the country, right? And yet emissions have gone up, what, like seven, eight percent under Governor Inslee, like, come on. Um, and so I'm, I'm a really big proponent of you got to start somewhere. Um, and you know, we're sort of seeing that right now with the infrastructure package, you know, in, in Congress is that, you know, President Biden's gone big and bold. And um, what if we, you know, maybe, maybe that'll pass the reconciliation, but it's like big and bold is not enough. It actually has to result in something. Um, so I, I, I really think that that's important that we get some legislation across the finish line that says climate as Republicans and Democrats on board um, and actually reduces greenhouse gas, you know, carbon emissions. Um, I, I think it's a really important place to start. I mean, in terms of translating that to other areas, um, I, I think it's important to build that trust because there's a lot of mistrust um, when it comes to climate policy. And I think that the significance of uh, enacting climate policy that's actually going to benefit the people who are often most suspicious um, of big government uh, climate policy is going to be really significant. And then just also getting, you know, Republicans and Democrats in Congress kind of like used to be working with each other on this rather than... Um, throwing snowballs at, at each other. Well, I've had an interest, a few interesting experiences in my time at Nori with, we had one farmer who just dropped out of the marketplace because he said, I don't believe in climate change, therefore I don't want to participate. I mean, that's our understanding. Didn't talk to him directly. We have had others who have said, don't talk about climate change with the farmers, talk about the benefits. And to me, that is fine because their benefits are enormous, but it also concerns me because I don't want to hide the importance of what they're doing and it is important. So do you ever get that kind of 
feedback quill from conservatives who are like, okay, we can support this because it's agriculture, it's helping farmers, but we're not going to support, you know, we're not going to call it a climate solution. I, I, I've heard that before. Yeah. Um, and I think that there are some people, you know, I, going back to the most basic sort of like politics around climate change, there's a generational divide, right? Um, you know, for some people, it's better to talk about clean air, clean water and Christian stewardship, right? That's, you know, that's a, that's talking about it in different ways to different people is really important. Um, and, you know, being from Seattle, a, a very progressive place and a progressive family, I am, you know, I, I'm, aware of our tendency being from that place to kind of have our own self-righteousness about, you know, getting those people to understand that climate change and global warming is really serious. And I think it's important for us to check that um, and, you know, cast a wide net, build a broad coalition. And maybe we don't all use the same terms, but I think if we're moving in a similar direction, uh, the broader our coalition is the better. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that it's, it's important to be, um, for, for forgiving and understanding in that in that regard, um, and really focusing on the the, the shared goal rather than the um, sort of the, the the headlines and the language around it. Can agree with you more, Holly. Anything? I also think the way into this is probably not around counting carbon. I think there's a path that goes through adaptation, and I'm just remembering, you know, in the summer of 2019, there were terrible floods in the middle of the country, and I was. Um, staying at a regenerative farm in Nebraska and every other farm their corn was just standing in water just the the soil did not you know take up the water but this guy's corn was like normal and I think you know you can see that from the road it's very tangible and unfortunately as these climate impacts mount people are going to be thinking more about how to cope with them so that could be one area that I, I think maybe we don't discuss enough. It's yeah. about the resiliency that regenerative agriculture actually brings and the important, yeah, that's one of the most important, I think, points that often gets lost to, to what you were saying, Holly. We forget to mention that actually you'll weather these climate changes probably better when you implement these regenerative agriculture practices. Do you know if any of the farmers, other farmers changed after that flooding and they saw that neighbor? Did it have an impact? I'm not sure, but it's interesting. I've heard a lot of stories of people, you know, there's le these learning networks among farmers and they learn a lot by YouTube and watching the other YouTubes. It's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm hoping that they're teaching one another. Will, anything else you kind of want to add to this being so passionate? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, um, you know, and this has been one of my battles and, you know, one of the reasons that I come at this from a more, or one of the reasons that I think it's really important for conservatives to be at the table here is I think that there is a tendency um, among, you know, those of us in the environmental community to put, um, to, to, to make, there, there's been a tendency in the environmental movement to sometimes make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, and I know that well from being, being from Washington state and our, our policies there. Um, and I, I just, I think that it's so important to, to, to meet people where they're at, um, not in spite of the crisis and serious challenges that we're facing, but because of them. Um, because, and I, I think that that's really the, 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 the most important way to take this issue seriously is to do the work of meeting people where they're at um, and pursuing policies that do not necessarily solve the whole issue, but move the ball forward. Um, and that's, you know, that's been a lot of my work and just, you know, to the earlier point too, um, I, I think that I've, I've heard a lot of people, um, you know, whether they're in agriculture or in, you know, some other industry in very conservative areas of the country saying, you know, to, to drought or to flooding, you know, this is not normal. I think a lot of people are coming around to that. Um, and we're not going to, you know, get them on our team by saying, well, you stupid idiot, how you didn't get it all this time, but like, with open open arms saying let's let's work together on this and let's address it and you know also the fact that in many places like miami where we're holding our, our conservative climate rally that uh adaptation uh is the is the solution that's most badly needed right now because climate change is already there um so i think that's a that's an important point too well thanks quill though i appreciate your insights and i actually agree with pretty much everything you just said because yeah, you can't force people. You've got to meet them where they're at. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Holly to maybe give us a good news story of the week for climate activists or people interested in the space. 
Well, one thing I'm watching is this International Maritime Organization meeting next week. Um, they were kind of slammed in the New York Times today, but there was one story that's good related to this, which is that Maersk is calling for a carbon tax on shipping fuel of $150 a ton. So kind of following this thread of, you know, big corporate action. I thought it was a bold call and a pretty high number, pretty, you know, if that happened, it would get us somewhere. <laughs> it would be a great signal to the market. That's for sure, I think. With that, thank you so much for joining us, Quill. You are as articulate as your coworker, Chris is, and we really enjoyed having you on. Um, and Holly, oh, as always, so great to have you. And to all our listeners, we will see you next week. So thanks for tuning in.